um, I want to intro Rodney Brooks. Rodney is a preeminent expert in robotics, computer vision, AI, artificial life. He was the founder and um, CTO of Rethink Robotics. Prior to that, he was a board member and CTO of iRobot. And now he has a new company called Robust AI, which we're going to hear all about. Thank you, Rodney. Well, oh, yeah, I can hear myself. OK, so I guess you can hear me. Um, thanks for being here. Um, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, a little bit about what Robust AI is doing. We, we were founded two and a half years ago. We completely changed where we were going about a year ago. And this is the first time we've even mentioned what we're doing. And we're really working in logistics and manufacturing, so it fits pretty well with, with uh, people here. Um, and I, I want to sort of go back over my history a little bit um, because it, it informs what we're trying to do. You know, Roomba um, uh, operates in unstructured environments where there's stuff on the floor, the furniture moves around. It's not a nicely controlled sort of environment. Another product we built at iRobot, which then got sold eventually off to FLIR, uh, was the PackBot. We had 6,500 of those in Iraq and Afghanistan doing roadside bombs, uh, getting rid of roadside bombs. But these pictures are from two packbots in the Fukushima Daiichi power plant soon after the meltdown in uh, 2011. And they're taking photos of each other. No people can go in this space. It's too radiation full. And there's rubble on the floor. And the robots were able to go in there and operate. If you had to clean up the place before you let the robots in, that was sort of the point of the robots. So they had to operate in an unstructured environment. And the more recent company, Rethink Robotics, built the Sawyer robot. Here is uh, Sawyer building uh, um, electric street lights, uh, LED street lights, in a factory in Mexico. And you can see that the fixturing is made of PVC pipe, and it's pretty floppy and unstructured and, and a mess. And that's how I like to think about how robots really should be. They should be able to deal with unstructured environments. And when you're building robots and building a product, and we saw um, in Nadia's talk this morning about Ocado, you know, they go through iteration and iteration of, of robots. But, so things change. But uh, how you order what you do in building a product or building software for a product is it's sort of important. There's a lot of different complexities of environments. I showed you my three previous robots there, all working in unstructured environments. And you, there's a sort of bar over which you have to get the robot be able to operate in an unstructured environment before it's useful. If it, below that line, it's useless. Uh, so there's a viable product above that line if you can operate in an unstructured enough environment and non-viable below that line. There's also task complexity. How, how complex are the tasks you want the robot to do? And everyone sort of thinks, well, I want to be in that gold star position. I want to be able to operate in an unstructured environment and do complex tasks. But how do you get there? Because you start off with nothing, and you're going to develop your hardware or your software or whatever. Um, and often people go this direction. They want to show how good the robot's going to be, what sort of complex tasks it's going to be able to do. So they work on task complexity before they figure out how to deal with the environment complexity. But when you get over to the right there, that's a really steep slope. So I think it's better to start off thinking about what's the minimal um, task complexity that would make a product, work up the curve on environment complexity before you start to make the tasks uh, more, more and more difficult for the robot. And that will give you something that can operate you know, with 100% reliability or close to 100% reliability early on. So what we're doing at Robust is um, putting mobile robots into pretty unstructured uh, places. So this particular warehouse is sort of pretty extreme in terms of lack of structure. It's, it's nothing like the, the grid Ocado robots uh, that they are able to operate in. But you know, we see. Ocado, we see Amazon, we see all those 
places with big fulfillment centers, whereas the vast bulk of stuff is done in very small warehouses where there is no automation at the moment. But they still have the problem of getting enough employees. So any help for the employees with automation is good. This is a factory, and this is the sort of factory that doesn't have um, AGVs or other, um, even, doesn't even have uh, uh, conveyor belts. Um, it's very unautomated. But to put automation in a, in a place like this, this is the packout center. They, they're building robots, by the way, in this factory. Uh, I took this photo in a factory in China where we were building Roombas. And the, this, this station is the packout before they get eventually put in containers and shipped across the world. So having robots, mobile robots, in these sorts of environments is what we're trying to do. And we're building collaborative mobile robots, or building the software for collaborative mobile robots. What's a collaborative mobile robot? Um, there's all sorts of mobile robots around. There's AGVs, autonomous guided vehicles, and we like to think of them as being like bears. You want to be on the other side of the fence to them. Either you, you want to be in the cage, or you want the bear in the cage, but you don't want to be in the same place as the bear. And autonomous guided vehicles, which don't do any sensing except a wire in the floor, um, or automatic guided vehicles, <coughs> are, are sort of like bears. You don't want to get near them, because they'll just smash into you. Now, a slightly better thing, and we, we hear a lot about these, is uh, uh, autonomous mobile robots. And that's what uh, Amazon has. And I like to think of them more as like goats. You know, if you're on the same side of the fence as the goat, it's not really going to hurt you, but it's not pleasant. You know, goats are not good to be around. Um, they're pretty annoying, in fact. And that's what most autonomous mobile robots are. They're really annoying, because they don't care about people. So we're much more interested in you know, building collaborative mobile robots, which are more like service dogs. They're fun, they're nice, they do good stuff for you, they're OK to have in your house. Um, you know, you're not going to be annoyed by them. So that's what we're trying to do on the right. <clears throat> so autonomous mobile robots today treat people as a point cloud of, of you know, their sensors, their lidars, just, just see you as points in the space, and you've got to go around them or, or, or whatever. They're just, you know, a person, a chair, they're all the same to AMRs. We like to think of um, collaborative mobile robots as treating people like dance partners, intimate with them, and collaborators. So here we, we've got a, in a warehouse, um, this person is picking, maybe he's doing zone pick, picking multiple orders at once, and the robot there has been following him along just being in just the right place as he's picking, so it's always there, but not close enough to bang into his uh, ankles. So it understands that he's a person, understands what he's doing, knows what it should be doing um, to help. Um, often, today's autonomous mobile robots really piss people off. Um, uh, they annoy them and leave them really frustrated, and I can't find, I couldn't find photos of this, but we know from having gone into uh, hospitals, many of the hospital robots end up pushed off to the side, switched off. And you ask the, the staff, why is the robot over there? Oh, it wasn't working, so we, sh we shut it off. What that means, that's code for, is that robot really pissed us off because it barrels down the middle of the corridor. It's taking the dirty sheets or the dirty dishes off to wherever they, they're handled. And it doesn't care if, if someone's, got a, you know, someone's got a patient on a bed and they're running down the corridor with the patient on the bed. It doesn't get out of the way. It doesn't know. It's just a point cloud. It's an obstacle. And so it really messes things up. So <clears throat> um, we think collaborative mobile robots should put people first and be responsive to them. So here's an example <coughs> which our robots can, or the software on our robots can figure out. If there's two people sort of facing each other, and maybe they're socially distanced, that might be a nice place for the robot to go between them, but the robot realizes in the semantic content that it shouldn't. 
If those two people were facing away from each other, both doing picking, maybe in a warehouse, it would be okay to go between them. So understanding what people are doing and why leads to a much better experience with robots and people. And the big thing, the big problem, is putting automation in unautomated situations. You can rebuild the whole system, which is expensive, or you can have incremental stuff going into a, an unautomated place, an unautomated factory, or an unautomated warehouse. But there's still systems integrators. And you know, people are trying to get rid of system integrators as much as possible because it's a big expense. And we think that's really important. Collaborative mobile robots should be able to be set up and used by anyone. And we actually solved that problem pretty well, I think, at, at uh, iRobot with the Roomba. There's no system integrators. They're just a person who bought the robot now online in the old days at, you know, uh, uh, um, well, um, all over the place, uh, Walmart, wherever they bought it. They bring it home, they take it out of the box, they don't have to tell it, oh, that, that's the charging station over there to the left of the couch. The robot figures that out. All they do is take it out of the box, press the clean button, and everything else works. And it figures out what the house is, the map of the house, et cetera. And the latest versions also recognize things like uh, cables, so they don't go and mess with the cables. They stay away from them. They don't get caught up. They don't get tangled, et cetera. That's the sort of thing where you think, that is a way to get to incremental automation from a totally unautomated system. No setup, no code writing, no real configuration. Just put the robots there and tell them what to do. So that's our model for collaborative mobile robots. And we think that there's a really good set of reasons for why this can be done now and couldn't be done very well until quite recently. You know, we've talked about Moore's Law for years and years. People have talked about Moore's Law, things getting twice as fast, twice as much memory, twice as much everything. But Moore's Law has come to an end. If you track your, uh, uh, how many uh, gigahertz your laptop runs at, it hasn't changed much for the last 10 years, really. And that's actually because of the breakdown of Dennard scaling, where you just can't get more things running faster without the heat going up way too much. So for, since the mid-60s, being a computer architect was in some sense sort of boring because you just had to make the things you could predict when the competitors would be twice as fast or have twice as much memory or twice as whatever. And your job was to make sure your product was there. And if you tried to do something different, then that exponential growth would overwhelm you before you had a chance to make it happen. So we saw companies like the one, in, uh, one here in, um, um, in uh, Boston, or in Cambridge, the connection machine out of MIT, which was a massively parallel computer in the 80s, I think. And it just got stomped on by software. Uh, so there w wasn't much innovation. But with the end of Moore's Law and the end of Dennard scaling, it's actually a golden age for computer architecture right now. And what computers and computers are looking like is very different from what they used to be. So there's not just GPUs, graphic processing units, but neural processors being attached to multi-core little chips. And so you get teraops of 16-bit wide floating point. Teraops of billion, billion, no, a million, million operations a second. You get many teraops on cheap little chips now, unbelievable amounts of computation. Um, and that computation is moving out to the edge of devices, partially driven by Industry 4.0 um, uh, and the Internet of Things, but it's actually putting computation right next to uh, cameras. So when you buy a camera today, it often has teraops of computation on it. So now this changes the architecture of how you do stuff, where you do the computing, and how much computing you can do, because you don't have to ship the data more than two millimeters before it's processed. Um, so it changes the architecture and performance levels. And meanwhile, most autonomous mobile robots are stuck where the puck was, not even where the puck is today, and certainly not where the puck is going in a couple of years. They've got a real innovator's dilemma because they, they've got a system based on an old architecture for computation 
which is no longer true and isn't the place where it's all happening. So massive amounts of computation. Second thing, of course, is deep learning has brought new capabilities to AI. Not exactly how everyone thinks. And if you Google my name, Rodney Brooks, and Seven Deadly Sins, you'll find an article in Technology Review on why I think people overpredict and wrongly predict what AI is capable of. One of the things is the big, the big one really is performance versus competence. Uh, if you see something perform something, if I, if I see Natan perform some task, then I, I've got a good idea of what else he can do. So if I see him um, uh, doing a nice drawing, then I, I don't know whether he can or not, actually. I have no idea. But if I see him doing a nice drawing, I figure I could ask him to draw something else and he'd be able to do it because he's got a, he's got a general competence. Whereas in a lot of the AI systems are really narrow in what they can do. They can perform well, but they don't have a general competence. So that's got people a bit confused about what, what deep learning can do. But don't mind, it's actually, a, there's a good news piece here too. So people think that computer vision is human equivalent. It's not human equivalent. Um, convolutional neural networks are texture biased. Um, human is shape biased. If you go to neuro, neural, neural, I, neurips, neural information processing conferences, lots of papers about how to get more shape in so that you don't get these adverse, adversarial um, uh, cases where you change something slightly with a little bit of texture and it completely breaks down. But it's not human equivalent. But it, it, it really can get stuff based on texture quite well. People think that AI systems can recognize objects. Eh. AI systems are good at labeling images. They're really good at labeling images. That's different from recognition. It's not quite the same. On the other hand, you know, people think that training specific objects takes large, large data sets, but um, nowadays, um, CAD and a small data set, you can produce a large data set automatically and train off hardly any instances for things that are important in warehouses and things that are important in factories. So it's better than people think. Um, running models um, to, to, to get labels is thought of as computationally expensive, but today it can be done out on the camera and run lots and lots of neural networks on a single camera right there where the image is being formed. And lastly, people, th people think that mapping, you need to use LIDARs. Now, I don't want to sound like a musketeer here, um, you know, Elon says you don't need LIDARs on cars. I think you do because outdoors you're competing against human eyes which have 12 orders of magnitude in, in uh, uh, brightness detection. But indoors, you don't have that much variation in lighting. And then passive cameras can do it very well with visual slam these days. So these things which aren't quite what people think they are, as long as you exploit what's really there, it's good. And then there's these great new things um, that, that you can really grab and run with. So we've been building these systems. Uh, we're about to go out into our first customers with these robots. I didn't show any videos of them because we've still got a couple of patent things that need to be wrapped up before we get there. But I'm, I'm more excited than I have been about anything for a long time because I think this is these collaborative mobile robots are going to feel very different than existing robots in factories and existing robots in, in warehousing. And it will let bring automation to much smaller facilities. And the vast majority of business in the world is done in small places. So it is a way of getting automation into them. So thanks for your attention. If you want to be an early customer or, or do trials with us, just send me an email. We'll be happy to talk to you and show you more about what we're doing and how it can uh, maybe transform your small enterprise into a digital enterprise much more quickly than you would have thought. Thanks very much.